live on WFLA Now. With a specialized degree in climate, Chief Meteorologist and Climate Specialist Jeff Berardelli is pioneering the way we look at climate and extreme weather. Welcome to Jeff's Climate Classroom, powered by Armor View Window and Door. All right, welcome everybody to this week's Climate Classroom. The aim of this show is climate education, as you would probably expect, given the name. We use the biggest current events in climate to shed light on our changing planet. Now, this show airs live on WFLA's Facebook page and WFLA.com. And then afterwards, you can find it on YouTube, Spotify, and Apple Podcasts. Now, today's main topic, and you may have heard of this, The world's oceans are alarmingly hot right now. In fact, far above records for this date. And the math tells us that what we're seeing should be statistically impossible in a quote-unquote normal climate. But our climate is no longer normal as climate heating has loaded the dice for more extremes. So it's time to bring in today's guests to discuss. Catherine Nimchik is my longtime climate producer and my great friend. She is now a climate media specialist whose job it is in this particular show. She's got to keep me honest, and she's got to keep the conversation focused on what you, the viewers, want to hear. Hey, Catherine. Hi. Thanks for having me. Glad you're here. And also, marine scientist Dr. Ellen Prager. I have known Ellen for a while now as well, and she is so good at making the science digestible so that everyone can understand it. Hey, Ellen. Hey, Jeff, thanks for having me. I'm glad you can be here. Now, I just want to note one thing before we start our discussion. You can submit your questions on our Facebook page, either the WFLA Facebook page or my Jeff Berardelli uh, Facebook page. And then Catherine's going to be looking through those questions, and she's going to ask myself and and Ellen uh, the questions that you have, and we're going to do our best to answer. All right, so I want to begin just by giving kind of a description of what is going on. So take a look at that map you see right there in the middle of the screen. You see a lot of red and very little blue. The global oceans are not just at record levels. They are way, way, way above record levels. Part of that is due to a developing El Nino in the eastern Pacific Ocean. And then there's a whole bunch of weather reasons why it's very warm in the eastern Atlantic and in the uh, main development region, the tropics, which may pose some problems for hurricane season, some of that has to do with a lack of Saharan dust, and we're going to be talking more about that as well. I want to show you this graphic right here to give you an idea of how far away from normal and how far away from records we are. All those lines you see on there, they're basically from 1980 until now. And we see the red, that is this year, and we are at one degree Fahrenheit, not above normal, but above records in the North Atlantic Ocean. And by the way, I can say almost the same for the globe right now, where the statistical probabilities of having what we have right now on the entire globe of being this warm right now are something like one in several hundred thousand, if not more rare than even that. All right. So with that said, I want to bring Ellen into the conversation. Ellen, I'm sure you are watching this as a marine scientist. So as someone who's been doing this for a very, very long time, Have you ever seen anything like this, and does it in any way alarm you? So, no, I haven't seen anything like this. And I could say, personally, I was recently in the Galapagos, and the water was way warmer than it should be, even at the beginning of an El Nino. So that's right on the equator in the sort of eastern Pacific. So really warm. Does it shock me? No. Does it alarm me? Yes. Given El Nino in the background of climate change. Honestly, I'm not sure this is even unexpected. We knew this was going to start happening, and the question really was when. Well, here it is. Uh, you know, and and I kind of try to equate it with this. Um, let's say you're trying to dunk a ball. It's almost like climate change put a big bench under you. Now it's much easier for you to dunk the ball. It's much easier for us to reach these extremes. So, Ellen... Catherine has a question about the Galapagos. Whenever I talk to Catherine, she's a lot less interested in the extreme weather and a lot more concerned about life and, and animals. She has, she has a heart. I don't have one. So, Catherine, go ahead. Ask <laughs> Ellen what you were going to ask. Well, I want to know how ocean life is going to be affected by these uh, rapid temperature changes. So that's a great question. El Ninos have a very big impact in the Galapagos Islands and especially strong El Ninos because what happens is the food web, which is really fueled by upwelling of cold nutrient rich water, 
gets shut down. You get a warm cap of water, shuts down upwelling, shuts down productivity, and a lot of the animals can't find the food they need. It's, it's actually a pretty difficult time in the Galapagos. The marine iguanas die, sea lions, pups can't make it. The carrying capacity of the animals goes down. So it is a huge issue. The past couple of years, you know, climate change has been sort of masked there by La Nina. We've had an unusually long La Nina. Everything has been flourishing in the Galapagos, but now that's probably going to change. Ellen, I'm looking what at about- these. Uh, wait, Catherine, I don't know if you yeah. guys can see the graphic I have up, but you can mm-hmm. see the Galapagos. I mean, it is just boiling there. We're talking several mm-hmm. degrees Fahrenheit, if not more above normal. Ellen, I understand that in the two last big El Ninos, you that those islands lost something like 50 to 75 percent of the Galapagos penguins, right? The penguins died because they couldn't find food. Right. They, the penguins, the penguin population was drastically reduced. In the past couple of years, the Galapagos Park Service has done a great job bringing them back. But this is really worrisome. And I will tell you, in the 82-83 El Nino, that was another very strong one, the Galapagos lost 95% of the corals. Mm. So El Ninos have a history of a big impact in the Galapagos. Right, and you pile the already warm natural warming from El Nino. It's a natural cycle, everybody. This is not climate change, but it is on top of the climate change baseline, which has warmed the oceans by around one and a half to two degrees Fahrenheit. And so now you're reaching extremes that this biological diversity may not be able to adapt to. Am I right about that? Exactly. Again, sort of the baseline, what we think of what it should be, and then you get El Nino turning on, is nowhere near what it was. You have to consider climate change as the starting point now, that o- warm ocean. Right. Remember, one of the things that people don't talk about a lot is that something like 90% or more of the excess heat from the atmosphere is being absorbed into the ocean. That's where that ocean heat is coming from. All right, Catherine, um, I know you have more questions. I know you read my article. Mm-hmm. You sent me like, mm-hmm. I, 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 there were so many questions you sent me in that email. I didn't even have time to read it. So go ahead. What do you, what do you, what's on your mind? Well, a lot of people are talking about tipping points um, in, in relation to this. Um, I was wondering if you could kind of explain what those are and if this is one. Okay, so I'll, I'll take it first, Ellen, and then if you want to jump in, um, you can jump in. So basically the premise is when, when we see – temperatures that are as high as you see in that graphic right now above records not above normal but above records it's just most people that are in climate think did we break something i mean i think that is a natural question is something broken i can't say for sure that we didn't break something but usually tipping points don't happen over the course of a few weeks right or or even even a couple to a few months when we talk about tipping points it's Rever- we, we basically reach a point in, in some part of the climate system. Let's take the Amazon rainforest just as an easy explanation. If you burn too many trees, the Amazon rainforest just starts to go away. Why is that? Because trees produce its own their own moisture through evapotranspiration. The reason why the Amazon's so wet is because trees actually produce the rain. You get rid of the trees, then you have you have no more rain, and then the forest transitions from uh, the rainforest to a savanna. That is a tipping point, right? It doesn't happen like that. It takes years and years for it to happen. But once you cross a certain tipping point, then at that point, there's no going back. It's irreversible. So just an answer to the question, I don't think we've passed a tipping point. There are a lot of very good meteorological and oceanic reasons why this is just, I think, a lot of coincidental coincidental factors piling on top of each other to kind of yield this, and a lot of it's El Nino. But Ellen, let me bring you in. What do you think? So I think part of it depends on how you define tipping points. If you're talking about, are we going to see more consequences from high ocean heat, moisture in the atmosphere, a warmer atmosphere, higher sea level, are we going to continue to see that? Yes. That's in our future, is it irreversible? Hopefully not. I'm gonna I'm gonna take a point. No, it's not. We can still mm-hmm. do a lot of things to stop it. Right. So the tipping point of these things are gonna continue to happen. They're probably gonna get worse. Yes, but the, I think the point here is ir- is it irreversible? And I think we should say no because there are things we can do. 
So graphic that I have up there right now is Saharan dust, or I should say lack of Saharan dust. So what's happening this year in the Atlantic, because we talked about the Pacific, we know why it's warming, El Nino, right? That's, that's natural warming. Essentially, during La Nina years, all that heat is stored, a lot of it subsurface, so it's not actually in contact with the atmosphere. During El Nino years, all that heat is brought up. It becomes in contact with the atmosphere. And once it does, that ocean uh, atmospheric interface really starts to row things up in the atmosphere and causes a lot of extreme weather. And it causes weird things to happen uh, thousands of miles away. So one thing that has happened, probably somewhat related to El Nino, is we have a very weak high, very weak Azores high in the Atlantic. Now, typically it'd be strong. It would cause a strong circulation. It would cause strong trade winds or winds that blow from the east to the west across the tropics that would bring a lot of dust into the Atlantic Ocean. A lot of dust would obscure the sun. It would cool the ocean waters. We have very little dust this year. So it's one of the reasons why Atlantic Ocean temperatures in the tropical Atlantic are the hottest they have ever been this time of year. Take a look at that graphic right there. Where you see the deep shades of red, That all those areas are record hot in the main development region of the Atlantic, which is why scientists are a bit alarmed that this could really contribute to hurricane season. So what we're hoping for is that El Nino, which is, you know, the warming of the Pacific, will actually cause enough wind shear in the atmosphere to knock down those storms. So the storms may form across the main development region, tropical Atlantic, but then they may hit a wall of El Nino wind shear in the Caribbean. Now, Catherine, I said a lot. Now, pretty soon I want to tell everyone at home that Catherine's going to have a buzzer and she's going to be able to interrupt me when I go on these rants. And it's going to be, don't laugh, because it's going to be connected to electricity. And it is actually going to shock me into stopping talking. We're going to test it on JB. And if he's if he's healthy, if he remains healthy, then we're going to use it on me. Okay? I'm not kidding. We're really going to have a buzzer. We're going to have a buzzer. Because it's the only way to stop yeah, me not the, not the electricity part. Well, okay. That's good to hear, for me at least. So, Catherine, yeah. what, did, what did I say that you didn't understand? Well, I think it makes sense. I mean, I, talking about, there's a lot of factors um, at play here. And um, one other interesting point, um, similar, I guess, to uh, the dust are the um, less pollution. Yeah. So since the 1970s, the Clean Air Act was passed. The United States produces a lot less pollution. That means there's less aerosols across the Atlantic Ocean. That means that there's more sun being let in. So less pollution allows more sun to come in, and that has warmed the oceans over the past couple of decades. And sometimes when we talk about this uptick in hurricanes over the past you know, 20, 30 years, we often say that it may be as much related to the reduction in pollution as it is to the um, increase in warming of the oceans from greenhouse gases. Now, more specifically, Catherine, I think you're alluding to that law that was passed in 2020, which no longer allows these big cargo ships to emit sulfur dioxide into the atmosphere. We've seen about an 85 percent decrease in sulfur dioxide uh, in the Atlantic Ocean um, in the atmosphere there over the past uh, two years or so. Uh, and that also is reducing pollution. But the, but the real jury is out on, on how much extra warming is happening. Is it just a tenth of a degree? Is it a lot more? It's something that's being studied right now. But it is certainly compiled on top of all the other reasons why we're seeing this crazy spike. Ellen, do you have anything to add to that? I uh, just I've looked at a little bit of the data and some of the research, and I think it seems pretty insignificant as compared to the carbon dioxide from other sources. So it's definitely something to look at, but I don't think that's the thing that you can say is is really causing this. I, th I think it's like Jeff, like you said, it's a contributor. Right. And I think that's the, the moral of this story. You see a lot of people freaking out on Twitter and on different social media because the oceans are just like so far above anything we've ever experienced before. But when you really start to dig into the science, you see that there are just a lot of coincidences happening. And I'm willing to bet dollars to donuts that about 50% of this can be explained by the shift between La Nina and El Nino. Because it's not just an increase in temperatures across the tropical Pacific. It also disturbs weather and oceanic patterns in other parts of the world as well. So I'm willing to guess that a, a, a a pretty, a pretty big chunk is El Nino, and I say that because it likely is a contributor to the weakening of that high in the Central Atlantic as well, which, of course, cascades into a weakening of the Saharan dust that comes off of off Africa. But one thing I want to mention also is we have in the most insane high-latitude polar 
uh, weather pattern that I have ever seen this time of year. In fact, we had a big severe weather outbreak in the southeast yesterday due to this crazy blocking pattern, this huge heat dome across Canada causing all these fires and all that smoke in the middle Atlantic. Ellen, you've been breathing it in lately, I'm sure, or you will be again pretty soon. Um, so that blocking pattern across the Arctic, that has some contribution undoubtedly from the tropical forcing from El Nino, but is likely due to the imbalance in the Arctic because of climate change. We know the Arctic is warming at around three times faster than the global average. Sure. Ellen, do you have, over the past several years, have you noticed pretty dramatic changes that you'd never seen in the past? Absolutely. And so I, I want to add something here to this. I, in the past couple of years, I was doing a bunch of research for a book called Dangerous Earth. And I spent a lot of time talking to glaciologists and a lot of people in talking about climate change. And one of the points everybody made to me is nobody was here the last time the earth, the CO2 um, concentration in the atmosphere was here. The ice sheets and the glaciers melt like they are now. We, we actually don't understand all the processes involved. So being shocked saying the ocean's getting small, well, We've never seen what the Earth system was going to do when the CO2 was this high. And I just want to read you something right from the book, because this was one of the things that hit me really hard. It said, um, I wrote in here, some three million years ago, carbon dioxide concentrations were similar to what we see today. Mm -hmm. 350 to 400 parts per million. Temperatures were one to three degrees Celsius warmer than now. And here's the big one. Sea level was up to 20 meters, meters higher. Meters. That's 60 feet. Meters. Yep. 60 feet. Mm -hmm. So remember, the last time the Earth was in this situation, nobody was here. We have we don't know how the Earth system is going to respond. Mm -hmm. And all of the models are based on what the Earth has been like. So I don't even want to call us abnormal or anomalous because we're in a very different system now. We're guinea pigs. Right. It's an unwitting experiment on ourselves. Yeah, and, and it's true. I, I, read, I was reading an article that reminded me of that. This Three million years ago, our carbon dioxide was probably less even than it is right now, right? But the, right. But the seas equalized at 60 meters higher. So we're really poking a bear right now, right? An angry beast. Catherine, uh, have, you been, have you been looking out for questions on Facebook or angry comments? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> there, are, there are a few angry comments. <laughs> Still waiting for questions. You think I'm kidding. Questions. You should see the comments I get on Facebook. Yeah, I, well, I do see them now. <laughs> oh, see, I told you. Were you prepared? Did I prepare you? I was not prepared. <laughs> Um, but I do want to ask, um, there's there's another possible uh, um, factor in this, and that's the volcanic eruption. Oh, yeah, um, hunger but I wanted, I, Yeah, and I wanted some clarity on that because that has to do with water vapor. And my confusion was, well, can you explain about how that's impacting it's a great the, question uh, ocean temperatures typically when a volcano erupts and it's above the ground above the ocean uh it spews a ton of pollution into the atmosphere and just like we talked about before the more pollution you have the more air we call them aerosols uh the less sunlight that comes in it cools the earth so when uh, mount pinatubo erupted in 1992 it reduced the global average temperature of by about a half a degree i think a half a degree to one degree fahrenheit uh, but this uh, volcano was under the water. And so instead of spewing pollution, it spewed water vapor, a ton of water vapor way up into the atmosphere and into the stratosphere. So the stratosphere is loaded with water vapor. What is water vapor? Water vapor is a greenhouse gas. And not only is water vapor a greenhouse gas, it's a greenhouse gas that's stronger than carbon dioxide. So essentially, we're seeing greenhouse warming from the Hunga Tonga explosion. Uh, the stratosphere still has a lot of residual water vapor in it. So that is also likely a compounding factor on top of the warming. So it is a lot of things, right? That's why, you know, of course, climate change is at the base of it. We, the graphic you're looking at right now, guys, 
that shows the oceans have heated up since 1901, and, and it's almost all red. And, and much of the ocean has heated up by two degrees. So again, that is the baseline. It's like me saying that I'm seven feet tall, right? I'm really not even six feet tall. Climate change has made me an extra foot taller. So it, it allows you to become, it, it allows you to reach extremes more easily. Here, I have a question. Okay. <laughs> so, so with the volcanic eruption, so let's say there's a lot more water vapor up in the atmosphere. One of the big questions with the climate models is clouds. Mm -hmm. yeah. So my question yeah. would be, you know, you got SO2 coming out from that volcanic eruption, which like you were saying is aerosols, which would cause cooling. Mm -hmm. But if you have more water vapor, what's the relationship with creating more cloudiness, which then could, you know, counteract the warming part? What do, what do you think, right, Jeff? Right, because you're a marine scientist. So I'm going to clarify why she's asking me this question. So she's a marine, a sci a marine scientist. So she's usually got her head under the water and I have my head <laughs> over the water in the atmosphere. Uh, exactly. Right. Uh, well, it, this is stratospheric water vapor, not tropospheric. So it's above the layer of the clouds. So that was an easy yeah. one to an easy one to answer. So, Catherine, you can keep in tabs on our Facebook uh, comments or questions. Yeah, I mean, I I have one uh, here. Let's see if I can get it to show up. <laughs> um, oh, look at yeah, you! Yeah, so. Yeah, Look at learning. You. you did that yourself. <laughs> That's amazing. So Sue said, "I came in late, but it seems like you guys are not worrying about uh, global warming." Um, so again, I, I think this is an opportunity to kind of clarify um, that it's human caused. Right. And natural causes, if we could uh, reiterate that. Right. So can we, I, we're, yeah, go ahead, Ellen. Go ahead. Yeah. You're, so you're just worried. from looking, yeah, looking mm -hmm. at that, I am extremely worried. And I've always thought of myself as not an alarmist. But I see on the, the question, the it seems like they're saying because it was like that three million years ago, we're not worried about it. But think about the earth was much warmer. Sea level was 60 feet higher. It was not a very hospitable place for humans. And so I'm not that worried about the planet itself. I'm worried about human society and, and animals and wildlife and all the life on earth, because we cannot adapt fast enough to these changing conditions. So I know we said it was like this three million years ago, but we weren't all here. And so I'm very worried. Um, you know, uh, I should say that any of those changes, by the way, that that possibly will occur because we've warmed the planet to uh, uh, almost to a, a temperature that we saw three million years ago when sea levels were 60 feet higher, that will not happen in a decade or even a couple of centuries. That, that would take a long time. However, we are going to cross some big tipping points uh, in terms of glaciers probably sometime later this century. And once we do, it's not going to happen in a few years. But, um, but at some point, we're going to see full big chunks of land ice just drop into the ocean and raise sea levels in a decade by over a foot. And, uh, you know, again, it could, it could happen in my daughter's lifetime. It's probably not going to happen in my lifetime. Uh, but, uh, but maybe. We don't know for sure, to be honest. Uh, but, I, but your point is well taken. And thank you for your question. No, we are concerned about global warming because modern man has never experienced anything like this. And let me just say one more thing. One more thing. Everything that we have on this earth is built in a system that is used to a climate that is like this. And right now, the climate is like this. We're no longer in the climate that we built all of our infrastructure to, which was 50 or 100 years ago. Look at the insurance industry in Florida. We lost another homeowner's insurance a company yesterday. 15 have left within the past year. So this is now hitting us in the pocketbooks. There are people who write me consistently on Facebook and say, Jeff, I can't get homeowner's insurance for my house. Either that's true or they have to get citizens, in which case they're gonna, their policy is going to double and triple. Oh, and by the way, Florida's uh, home insurance is about four times the national average. I bring that up because there's just one reason why, why I am scared of climate change. It's not just the big storms or it's going to hit us not just in the pocketbook. It's going to compromise our lifestyle. And at times, it's going to cause tremendous pressures on uh, internal and external migration. People are going to be forced out of their homes. What kind of political instability is that going to cause? So it's not just the typical things that you think about, like stronger hurricanes or higher heat waves. It's all of these geopolitical things that you have to start worrying about. And, and let me let me just add, think about what just happened with wildfires in Canada and the public health issue it has become. 
that, you know, California is seeing stronger, more intense wildfires. And this is a huge public health issue. Uh, we, I just experienced it last week here in Maryland, where it was unhealthy to go outside. And with climate change, we're going to see more wildfires, more intense wildfires, and in places where you might not have seen them before. There's also flooding problems. So it's all of these things combined, just like Jeff was saying, you've got home insurance. Think about food security. Food security is a real issue um, with the flooding and the climate change. There was a story about there aren't going to be peaches this year. I mean, that's <laughs> not you know going to survive it, but that's a lot of people's livelihood. And inflation. There are going to be major changes. And inflation. When you pile all these extremes on top of each other, when and then you pile it on top of war, the U Ukrainian war, uh, you, you, it, it, people don't realize this, but their prices are going up on everyday goods, and, and part of that is due to climate change. You mentioned the fires. I don't know if you saw the paper that came out this week by uh, a friend of mine, Dr. John Abatsaglu. I love saying Abatsaglu because it's very hard to say, and I'm very proud of myself that I can say Abatsaglu. <laughs> and I'm going to send this to him because <laughs> so I, we have someone laughing in the office. But I honestly, I perfected saying his last name. So I'm going to send it to him. I think he's going to laugh. But anyway, the paper that they put out is that Basically, almost 100% of the increase in burned acreage in California can be traced directly to human-caused climate change and warming. So, wow. so what's happening in Canada is, is the same thing, right? We're warming things up. We've been Now, let me just say, there are natural patterns, right? We've been stuck with this big heat dome across Canada. It just decided that it was going to set up shop across Canada this year. Next year, it's going to be Siberia, maybe, like it was last year, right? So the point is, but the problem is, is that we keep setting up these huge heat domes somewhere. They're bigger than they used to be. They're more persistent and more stubborn than they used to be. And they tend to dry things out. Uh, add on top of that, that it's a couple of degrees warmer than, let's say, a heat dome would have been several years ago. And now you have a recipe for disaster. It's drier. There's more evaporation because you're heating the ground more. And now when you light a match... Because climate change doesn't cause fires. You still have to, you still need an ignition, but you get the ignition and now everything burns out of control. And so California's, uh, excuse me, Cal uh, Canada's uh, wildfires this year are already uh, in record territory. Catherine, did I lose anybody, you think? No, but I do want to get back to the oceans and the original <laughs> chart <laughs> and the original chart. You want me to show um, an original chart? chart? The, orig the original chart that you had okay. um, at the beginning of this um, that shows the red line going drastically up. Um, I'm going, I'm making my the, way to it. Hold on, I'm making my way. Okay. Go ahead, you keep talking. I'll, I'll make my way to it. Okay. <laughs> okay. Um, so I just want to touch on uh, that this is rapid heating and how does that, I'm curious how that has a different impact on, on weather patterns or ocean life versus gradual heating and in order, there, is, in order if to there get, is a difference well let me i'll answer a teeny bit of that but ellen's gonna have to answer most of it so in terms of weather patterns when you get a rapid increase in ocean temperatures it takes a while for those ocean temperatures to translate into weather patterns so it takes weeks and months so i i you know if let's say there was a uh, some type of tropical storm or hurricane and your temperature shot up a couple of degrees fahrenheit right where the hurricane moved over, then you would see a, probably a better chance of rapid intensification and a stronger hurricane. But generally speaking, to tr for, for ocean temperatures to translate into climate and weather patterns over the course of weeks and months, it takes a long time. So there isn't an immediate impact, but for every one degree Fahrenheit of ocean temperature rise, the potential of a hurricane is about 10 miles an hour. So you have a strong hurricane, uh, let's say the oceans are two degrees warmer than they were a couple of years ago. You can see the hurricane strengthen about 20 miles an hour more if all the conditions are right. But in terms of the question on life and the effects on biodiversity, uh, Ellen would be the expert, not me. <laughs> so rapid warming has a great impact on life on the ocean. And think of it, you can almost think of it in two ways. Think about animals that can swim away. You know, marine life, they can swim and say, oh, the water's too warm. I'm going to get out of here. I'm going to head for colder water. So you might see uh, populations shifts. But what about for the things that can't leave, that are stuck in place, like coral reefs? And so corals, and a lot of people always associate corals with warm water, but they actually live within an optimum range of temperature. And when that range if it goes out of that range and the water is too warm, they get stressed. They expel their symbiotic uh, algae partners and they what called bleach and a lot of times if that is extended or acute those coral reefs will die 
And around the world, we are seeing coral mortalities that are beyond what we've ever seen. Mm -hmm. So there are going to be extreme impacts in the ocean. And I don't know if you saw in the news, another thing that can happen is fish kills. Along the, te the Texas coast, the water's been very warm. There hasn't been a lot of wind. And what happens, warmer water holds less oxygen. And they've had thousands and thousands of fish die because they're not getting enough oxygen. Mm -hmm. So there are real serious impacts when you see accelerated ocean warming like going on right now. I've seen that video, this... Ellen, and those pictures from Texas are just, oh, I mean, just they're fish terrible. piled on top of fish dead there. Those ocean heat waves have increased by uh, kind of exponentially. I, I have a graph somewhere, some, you know, I, but I don't, I can't dig it up right now. But um, in terms of um, ocean heat wave days, marine heat wave days, we've doubled them in just the past couple of decades. And uh, we're expecting to double again within the next few decades. Go ahead, Catherine. But what about uh, the risks of um, algae blooms? Do you want to answer I'll, that, uh, Sure, I'll take that. Yep, with algae blooms, uh, there's a couple, again, it's, it's, it's a combination of factors. Um, typically, when the ocean is warmer, it's more stratified, meaning there's not a lot of mixing. And when you get a lot of nutrients coming in, I mean, it's, it's a combination of things. So let's say you have a lot of rain, brings a lot of nutrients in from the land into the ocean, the water can't mix, and you get algae blooms. And the algae, when they, they live and then they die and fall to the bottom, Bacteria start using up the oxygen. You don't bring in any more oxygen because remember those waters are warm. They're not mixing. And that's when you get, not only you get algae blooms, when you get fish kills and hypoxic zones. The other thing with the temperatures, they seem to make a lot of, not many marine life, some marine life, more susceptible to disease. So they could facilitate more algae blooms and dead zones, which are increasing over time. We know that in association with climate change. Um, but there's, you know, again, these are sort of down the road. We're going to start seeing more of these things. So fish kills, algae blooms, and hypoxia. Right. Yes. There's, and then, of course, on top of that, with more carbon dioxide in the ocean column, you end up with more acidic water as well. So, uh, Catherine, any other questions from either you or from our viewers? Uh, my only question, and I, I don't see any yet from the viewers, they're kind of speaking amongst themselves. Um, but <laughs> that, sounds, that sounds about right. Yeah. Um, but I guess like to kind of sum up, what does all this mean? And is this a new normal? Is this our new baseline? It's a new abnormal, Catherine. So that's, yeah, I mean, that, right? I mean, you know, we keep raising the baseline. And so every time there's an El Nino, and we, by the way, we expect crazy stuff to happen during El Nino years. I expect to see, and I'm virtually certain of this, Catherine, I'll bet you a coffee, okay, or more, okay. Um, that we are going to see extremes this year that we've never experienced before all around the earth. But that's not really a, a guess. Um, there's certainty in that. We're going to see a, probably going to be a strong El Nino, maybe a super El Nino, on top of an, of an ocean that has warmed dramatically since the last El Nino. And every time we have El Ninos, and the last big one was 2015, 2016, we end up with record global temperatures. There is a very good chance that either this year or, if not next year, will be the warmest year ever on record for the globe since we've been keeping records. And by the way, that also means that it's the warmest year since... The middle since the middle of the last interglacial, which is over 100,000 years ago. So basically, this year is the warmest year on Earth in over 100,000 years, for sure, or next year. Uh, and basically, every year we see now is, is pretty much the warmest or one of the warmest. So, um, so in answer to your question, yes, this is the new abnormal. We're it's just going to temperatures are just going to keep rising until we stop releasing emissions from the burning of fossil fuels, greenhouse gases. Uh, and it's going to be a while before that happens. All of our economies still run on on fossil fuels. And despite the fact that we're seeing a surge in solar and wind, it's only displacing new demand uh, for energy. It's not actually getting rid of the amount of oil and gas being used. That has been pretty steady. It's not going up anymore. It's pretty steady. And what's come, what's happening is the solar and wind power, the clean energy that's coming in, is just simply being fed to, to increasing demand in a world that continues to grow in, uh, in terms of its population.
I see Ellen. Ellen, you you want to chime in? Uh, you know, I Jeff, I can't do anything but agree. I, I think I, I I have a problem with the you know abnormal versus normal. I mean, I I'm not sure what to call it. This is where we are. We're not sure where we're going because we've never been there before. So we're going to see, just like Jeff is saying, we're going to see extremes. And these are extremes that we haven't had before, uh, but it's it's the new earth system. Maybe that's what we need to call it. It's a mm -hmm. new system right? because we haven't seen it before. And we can't, What what is normal for us anymore? We don't know. You know, a lot of people are going to watch this. There are a lot of people who refuse to believe that climate change is either happening or, and it's not a large part of the population. It's really only about, so about 10% of people, absolutely, no matter what you do, could never be convinced that climate change is 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 happening or that it's being caused by humans. This is about two thirds of people believe that humans are the main culprit. Um, and then there are a bunch of people who are just not 100% sure. Um, but in terms of the people who flat out deny the reality of climate change and that humans are causing climate change, that's only about 10% of the population. Uh, but there are a lot of people that are probably watching right now that we couldn't possibly convince them uh, that this is the case. But what I can say is, regardless of, of whether you believe it or not, it's coming for your wallets. It's coming for your pocketbooks. You know, we're seeing increase in prices uh, in terms of inflation on our products. And some of that is due to more extremes in the climate. Insurance, no doubt. We're seeing stronger storms. Things are also more expensive to build. And so because of that, insurance companies are saying, I'm out. I'm not going to I'm not going to play in this in your sandbox anymore. And so we're seeing a lot of that as well. So, uh, you know, what you're seeing is is a lot of uh, leaders across the United States who are uh, willing to put money towards ad adaptation, but not towards mitigation. So essentially saying, all right, we're going to put all this money into adapting to warming. We know it's coming. We know sea levels are rising. We're going to put money towards that. When I think a lot of scientists, what they want to see is money towards just stopping the root cause of this as fast as possible. Um, and that's not something that we're seeing uh, happen nearly fast enough to right. meet the goals of the Paris Agreement. Right. And oh, can just, I, I just add one thing to that. Sure. Sometimes you hear the argument that, oh, we need to develop new technology. We don't know how to. That is not true. A lot of the technology and the, and the understanding of how to mitigate climate change, how to change the direction we're headed is already out there. So the argument of, oh, we need, need new technology. We don't know what to do. That's not true. We know what to do. We need the political will and investment to make it happen. Right. And the investment's happening, and it's happening really fast. The Inflation Reduction Act is pouring tons of money into clean energy, and it's doing it in the middle of the country. It's doing it in places that are just, there's a, lots of new battery uh, manufacturing plants, uh, EV manufacturing plants, there's new mining that's going to be coming online. The amount of money pouring in, the amount of manufacturing, not just globally, but especially here in the United States, and in a lot of rural areas, it is amazing. In fact, it's 80% of the money is actually going towards rural areas and only 20% towards non-rural areas uh, in terms of the investment in, um, in clean energy. So it is happening. It's happening. It, you know, it's debatable as to how fast it can happen because of transmission issues. That's a completely different show, and we're going to do that at some point. But listen, guys, I want to thank you very much, both of you, for uh, helping me out today. Thank you, Ellen. Thank you. And thank you, Catherine. Keep up yeah. the good work. <laughs> I, thank I, you. I'll try. I appreciate it. And I want to thank all of you for joining me on this week's episode of Climate Classroom. Check out my article. It, it lays out every reason why the oceans are so hot right now. And yes, climate change is only a part of it. There are a lot of natural reasons. So go to WFLA.com and read this article. And I want to end by saying what I always say, which is climate change is, in fact, one of the biggest challenges that humanity has ever faced, but it's also one of our biggest opportunities. Again, thank you for joining us. You can catch this show afterwards on Apple Podcasts, on Spotify, and also on YouTube for J.B. Buno and my guests, I'm meteorologist and climate specialist Jeff Berardelli. See you soon. Watch or listen to Jeff's Climate Classroom, powered by Armor View Window and Door on WFLA social media platforms. And find Jeff's climate reports on WFLA.com.